In 2010, director Christopher Nolan and star Leonardo DiCaprio gave the world a chilling descent into the depths of our dreams. In 2020, our whiskey travels once again have us returning to Japan. The movie is Inception. The whiskey is Hadazaki Small Batch. And we'll review them both. This is the Film and Whiskey Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at Christopher Nolan's 2010 film, Inception. You create the world of the dream. We bring the subject into that dream, and they fill it with their subconscious. How could I ever acquire enough detail to make them think that it's reality? Well, dreams, they feel real while we're in them, right? It's only when we wake up that we realize something is actually strange. Brad, this is our third Christopher Nolan film that we've done on the show, and it is, I believe, the 48th Leonardo DiCaprio movie that we've done. I don't know, Bob. I think it might be our 50th. Yeah. This (laughs) this might be the big big LX. Like, we are just delving into it. I mean, honestly, after this one, I think that the only big Leo movie that we haven't done is Titanic. I, I, I really actually do think that, Bob. I mean, like, we could do Blood Diamond or something, which is a good movie, but if we're talking about, like, culturally huge films, I think Titanic's the only one left after today. Yeah, that and What's Eating Gilbert Grape. Yeah, that's, that's right. Well, Brad, I'm I'm really excited to be talking about Inception today. I'm just going to go ahead and say up front that I think Inception is my favorite Christopher Nolan film. And rewatching it again, I was really excited because I knew it was coming up this season. And so I've held off on watching it pretty much since the podcast started a year and a half ago. And, you know, I got to say, watching it this time, Brad, was a really interesting experience for me because I can understand why some people are not as strong on this movie as I am. And yet, for me, I'm still willing to forgive everything that might not work for somebody else and just give myself over to it. It's one of those movies where it's like, I recognize that they're committing every sin that we get on directors about in this movie, and writers especially, and yet I'm still willing to just like completely overlook it for this film. Yeah, Bob, Inception is one of those movies that felt like a cultural phenomenon. Mm-hmm. You know you know what I mean? Like, Nolan had obviously made the Batman trilogy. He had done Memento. So, like, I, I think his name was out there. And sure. he was probably, like, a B-plus to A-minus list director. You know what I mean? Like, he was getting into the upper echelons. Right. This is the movie that cemented Christopher Nolan as, like, just a guru of mind-bending filmography. Well, you know what I mean? And you're not wrong, Brad. This is not just you giving an opinion. After the success of The Dark Knight, I mean, in that movie, broke records and took the world by storm. You know, they asked Christopher Nolan to come back and do a third Batman movie. And his condition was one for them, one for me, basically. He said, I'll do your Batman movie if you produce this movie I've been working on with my brother called Inception. And so they threw a bunch of money at it. They, you know, Warner Brothers made sure they did it right so that they could lure him back in for Batman. And in a lot of ways, people were kind of looking to Inception as the testing ground for can this guy sell a movie based solely on his own name? Now, again, you have the biggest movie star in the world, Leonardo DiCaprio, starring. So it wasn't like he was. Don't don't forget. Don't forget about Ellen Page. I mean, come on. (laughs) That's right. Academy Award nominee Ellen Page to you. That's right. So it wasn't like this year's Tenet where you have an up and coming star in John David Washington and it was literally just sold on Nolan's name. But this was the first time since the success of The Dark Knight that he was doing non-franchise work and the IP was just Nolan's. And the success of this movie, you're right, Brad, really launched him into the stratosphere so that two years later when The Dark Knight Rises came out, he really was one of the industry's most talked about names. Yeah, I I think this is a movie worth talking about our first experiences seeing it. For me, I saw it obviously right when it came out. I was working at a summer camp. And so like a whole group of the counselors 
and like support staff were like, man, I like we've heard about this this Inception movie and we'd seen the trailers. And so we like all went as this massive group of like 30 camp workers that probably smelled terrible, took <laughs> up like half the theater in Worcester, Ohio. And we, I, Bob, I think we watched it twice in the first day. Like we stayed in the theater for like an hour till the next showing to watch it again. It was so good. I think I probably watched it three or four times in theater that summer alone. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's one of the most perfect movie theater movies, too. And it's not just because of the big action sequences or, you know, things blowing up or special effects. It's the way it's all choreographed. It's the way it's staged. And with Nolan, one thing that he really, really does well is his movies have a sense of heft to them, like a sense of weight. When you go into a Christopher Nolan movie, you know that you are in the hands of somebody who really cherishes the cinema experience. And you're not just going to have like a small, you know, indie film anymore with him. It's going to be a big budget movie movie. And he delivers on that here. Yeah. And the the weirdest thing about it is that like th- I, this is probably my like 10th time seeing this movie. This mm-hmm. is one of the few times I feel like you, Bob, to be able to say like, ah, oh, yes, Inception, my <laughs> old friend. Right. That I'm just not going to lie, dude, this movie's not that great. Oh, interesting. <laughs> like, I still love it. And I'm probably like, I'm just going to say it right now, I'll probably still give it like an eight and a half or nine out of ten. Yeah. But but like, I will fully recognize that when you really peel apart the layers of this movie. Yep. It's not the best. It does not stand up to scrutiny the way that I thought <laughs> it would. It does not stand up to scrutiny. And the thing for me, Brad, isn't even, and and look, I know we're dragging the beginning portion of our episode out here, but let me say this. The thing for me that has become my hang up with this movie, and it literally just happened on this viewing, it's not that there's plot holes. It's not, you know, I'm not going to be the guy that's like, well, they didn't resolve this thread, so blah, blah, blah. It's more of the way that the movie is put together. It's more of, I, I think, the script For being as clever as it is and for paying off almost everything that they set up really, really well, the script is like all exposition and it's the dialogue is so clunky and you have like there was one moment, Brad, towards the end of the film where they're in the third dream sequence down. And if you haven't seen Mm -hmm. this movie, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but it's the dream within the dream within the dream, the snow fortress. And DiCaprio is like picking off guys with a sniper rifle. And Ellen Page, out of nowhere, starts asking him more questions about the rules of the dream. Are you just killing his brain? And no, he's no, like, no, 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 no. They're just projections. They're projections. And I, it happens dude, I in literally... the middle of an action sequence. <laughs> like they, I literally like, thought the same thing. It was like Christopher and Jonathan Nolan were like, ah, oh, crap, we forgot to answer that one question we had 58 pages ago in the script. <laughs> and he's like, just put it here. It's going gonna, it's gonna to totally work in this scene. And, and I think that there's a few instances like that where... They keep finding ways to complicate the plot, and it feels so manufactured. Like, you don't even know what limbo is until after they get into the dream. And I think for the most part, the actors sell the ridiculousness of this premise. But, like, when you have Tom Hardy and Joseph Gordon-Levitt talking about, we're going to drop into limbo, and Ellen Page is like, limbo? And they're like, unconstructed dream space. It's pure subconscious down there. I'm like, okay, now look, I'm still on board, Chris, <laughs> but I can see how this might be the part where people start unintentionally laughing. Yep. Yeah. I mean, when they when they started talking about limbo, I almost expected to hear the Law and Order SVU. <laughs> dun 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 dun. <laughs> like, like it's just rough. It's and really yet, ridiculous, and it's yeah. And yet, with all of it, I it's still. I was utterly entranced by this film yes. for my 30 second viewing. Like, and I think it comes down to what you said, Bob. I, I've never he- heard it put this way before, but it's just got some heft to it. It's got chutzpah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it feels it, like a big movie. It and that's does. what I love about it. Yeah. And, and once again, this comes back. If you listen to our Interstellar episode, it comes back to what I said about Nolan as a director in that episode. That I still think is true. Nolan swings for the fences. He does not know how to hit a single. He doesn't know how to bunt. 
He doesn't know how to take a pitch. Like he will swing at every single pitch and just try to knock the ball not only like over the fence, not only out of the park, but like over the state line. He is the like, big poppy of filmmakers. He is the big poppy of <laughs> He's filmmakers. David Ortiz of the 2000s. <laughs> I actually don't know what Christopher Nolan looks like, but I really hope he just has a big old gut <laughs> and just looks like David Ortiz. <laughs> oh, man. Well, Brad, we have kind of talked about some really <laughs> intricate plot points of this movie. Yeah, but by the way, the spoilers in this episode. Yeah, right. But if you haven't seen Inception, you are absolutely lost. And I have to say, Brad, this is not a reflection of your ability to explain anything. But I think even when we move into Brad Explains, you might do a great job of explaining things and people will still be lost because this is one of the most convoluted films uh, to have to break well, down for someone who's never seen it before. The, the movie is two hours and 27 minutes long. And Nolan uses about two hours and 20 minutes of it to give us lines of exposition explaining the movie. <laughs> so I, I'll give it I'll give it my best shot. One really interesting thing I do want to note, though, and I don't know if you if you ever like pause the movie to see where you are like time wise through the film. Mm -hmm. They enter the dream at the one hour mark. Yeah, it was so far in. I couldn't. Well, not even that. But I see I had the opposite reaction where I was like. I thought the movie was over halfway done when they went into the dream sequence and it's like 40% of the way done. And they spend the last hour and a half, hour and a half inside this guy's mind. I was actually really impressed by the fact that that much of the film takes place in the dream sequence. Well, Bob, what you don't understand is that when you're in the dream, <laughs> time for you as the viewer actually yeah. moves more slowly. Yeah, it was actually 48 hours that I spent <laughs> in that dream sequence. <laughs> All right, so Brad, we have talked around it long enough. Let's move into Planet Earth's favorite segment, Brad Explains. This is the part of the podcast where Brad breaks down the plot of the movie that he has just seen, often for the first time. That is obviously not the case today. And again, we will reiterate, spoiler alert for everything in Inception, Brad, can you offer our listeners a spoiler-filled review of the film Inception? Oh man, can I ever. So, Inception is a movie about a guy named Cobb. I, do we even get his first name? Yeah, his name is his Dominic or Dom Cobb. Dom, Sometimes they call him Dom, yeah. Yeah, that's what they call him. So we got Dom Cobb, which is like the most <laughs> New York name. I, I think it was just, he was just trying to flip around dot .com, and he was like, wait a minute, <laughs> Dom Cobb. <laughs> Dom Cobb. <laughs> so, so we got Dominic Cobb, played by the one and only Leonardo DiCaprio. At this time, still Academy Awardless. Right. And he is a, a, a brain mind thief who breaks into people's minds and steals their ideas, their secrets. And he does this by entering into their dreams. Uh, the, I, I will say one of my favorite parts about this movie is that it's really a high like sci-fi movie. Oh, yeah. That doesn't feel like sci-fi at all. Like, it feels like it's our normal world 100%, but they have the ability to enter into people's dreams and, like, share dreams with each other. And so uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is a master thief who is able to break into people's minds and steal things from their brains. Lots of corporate espionage, things like that. Well, you find out that they're, he is separated from his children and that his wife has died and that it's under mysterious circumstances. And it seems like he has like mastered the technique of going deeper and deeper and deeper into these dreams, more so than anybody else ever has. And so he is approached by Mr. Sato, who is a energy company CEO that is trying to plant an idea in a competitor's mind. His main competitor is about to take over like half the world's energy sources. And so he wants to get him to break up his empire. And luckily for him, his competitor is about to die and his son is about to inherit this empire. So he hires Cobb and his team to enter into the dreams of Robert Fisher, the heir to the Fisher energy empire, and plant this idea that he should break up his father's stranglehold on energy across the globe. And so so Cobb takes his team and he brings on a new architect that his father recommends to him. 
And he trains her on how to build these levels within the dream so that they can hide information and that they can go deeper and deeper to plant this idea. And so to plant the idea, they decide that they have to go three levels deep so that within the first level of the dream, they get their subject to fall asleep and go into a second level of a dream. And then in the second level, you got to make them go to sleep again and go into the third level of the dream. Obviously, the plan goes without a hitch. Everything's fine and dandy and good. And so by the end of the first level, they're being chased by his subconscious that's like security and they're trying to kill the intruders. And they go into the second level of the dream with the first level. They're in a car being chased by bad guys in the second level of the dream. They're in this nice hotel and they convince him that they are there to protect him, him being Fisher, their target. And so he jumps down into the third level of the dream. They eventually break in and they help him plant this idea that his father uh, doesn't think enough of him and that he he wants to challenge his son to try to make something of himself and not try to be his father. And so they plant this idea and it's all successful. And that part of the story is good. The part of the story that's not good is the fact that Cobb, the reason he is not allowed to see his children, he's not allowed in the U.S., his home country, is because he has been framed for killing his wife. His wife and him went so far deep into the dream world that they spent 50 plus years in this dreamland building with their minds. You can raise skyscrapers and do all sorts of crazy stuff with your brain when you're in these dreams. And they spent a, a whole lifetime in these dreams. And he finally convinced her that this, this dream world, which she had become convinced was real, he convinced her that it was not real and that in order to ascend from the dream back into the real world, she needed to kill herself, which is like, that's how you get out of the dream is you die. And so she became convinced that not only did she need to die in the dream world to come to the real world, this idea stuck in her brain that the world she lived in was not real and that she needed to kill herself in order to get out of the dream world. And so this was how Cobb realized that inception was possible, that you could plant an idea in somebody's brain because he planted the idea in his wife's brain that the world was not real and you had to kill yourself to get out of it. And so that is Inception, Bob. That's pretty much it, man. And I, I will say, the, the movie ends on an ambiguous note because uh, once they pull off the heist successfully, you know, Fisher has become convinced that he needs to break up his father's empire. Saito, being a very powerful man, makes a phone call and gets, you know, Cobb's charges dropped. He gets to enter the U.S. He sees his kids again. And the very last shot of the movie is a shot of this thing called a totem, which people who go into dreams carry with them. It's an object that only they know. And that way, when they uh, utilize this object, it's a way of telling them whether or not they're in a dream. And Cobb uses an object that belonged to his wife, which was a top that he spins. And if the top keeps spinning and never falls over, he knows he's in a dream. And the movie ends with him spinning this top on the table, getting distracted by being reunited with his children. And the camera slowly pans over to the top as it continues to spin, wavers a bit, but we do not see it fall over and it cuts to black. Which, Brad, I have to say, might be a gimmicky ending, but I absolutely love it. It's so good, It's dude. such a great touch to add to the end of this film. Oh, man. I remember the first time you walked out of the theaters having seen this. You're just like talking with your friends and you're just like, what the heck yeah. just happened? Yeah. <laughs> so, Brad, this is going to be an interesting movie for us to kind of parse out together because it sounds like one of those movies where we have to be very self-aware of the fact that we're we're almost breaking our own rules in a way, you and I. The things that we tend to nitpick about a movie are all present here. And and I can see why some people don't care for this movie. And I can see why some people might think it's just mediocre because of all the things that can be nitpicked. And yet you and I are kind of like, I get it. I see it. I recognize that it's there. It still works for me. And so yeah. it's going to be interesting to kind of get over that hurdle as we talk about this movie. Yeah, I, and I think that I don't think this will be the same review as Interstellar, but we literally kind of came down at the exact same point with that. But on that one, you were at a place where you're like, yep, it's not working for me. And yeah. I was like, 
I was like, yeah, like I, I can see what he was going for. And I really liked it. I think for me, the, the differences between this movie and Interstellar kind of just come down to entertainment value. This is just an entertaining movie. And I it thought is. that Interstellar was kind of a slog, to be honest. And, you know, Brad, there, there's you will not get one complaint out of me about the first hour of this movie before they press that button and go into the dream world. Christopher Nolan does such an impeccable job of world building that I I completely understood everything they wanted me to understand and any lingering questions that I might have had, I trusted him to answer as they went along. And I think that, you know, for those things that we will nitpick and, and where I think the movie starts to fall apart a little bit, they all come later in the film. But that first hour or so, it got its hooks into me so much that I was willing to go along for the ride and I was willing to forgive some things along the way, which is something that I can't say Interstellar ever did for me. Yeah, and I, I can't blame you for that. This cast is phenomenal, mm-hmm. and I, I'm just going to come out and say it. I think this is close to peak Leo. Oh. Like, I like oh. I love him in Aviator. I think that's his best performance I've seen him in. But this, I loved this version of Leo because it's somebody, it's a character who is the master of his field that is losing control. And you don't always see that with Leo. He always has a sense of control over himself, but this is a movie where he is able to portray somebody who is, like I said, he's the top of his field. He is one of the most renowned like masters of dream sequences uh, the, of anybody out there. And yet even he is struggling to understand what's going on with his own subconscious. And you see that struggle throughout the movie. And I just I really love Leo in this movie. Uh, so I think we're going to diverge a little bit here, Brad, because I don't think Leo's bad in this movie. I don't think Leo's bad in anything. But this is this is one of those performances for me as I watched it this time, especially after just coming off Shutter Island two weeks ago, that I really tried to study his performance and I think he's kind of bogged down in the dialogue, and I think that he is such an exposition fount that he doesn't really get a chance to sink his teeth into anything uh, more substantial in this movie until, like, close to the very end. I think that very last scene he has with his wife when they're in limbo is, or, or just getting ready to go into limbo, is incredible. I think both performers in that scene are fantastic. However... I think this is one of those performances that you see big A-list stars take sometimes. And for some reason, I keep going back to Jack Nicholson because Jack would have a performance where it's like you could tell he's giving his A-game. And then the next performance is like he's just going to be Jack Nicholson and we're going to get what we get. I think this is kind of just Leo being Leo. Like and I started to notice little things in his performance that I'm like, oh, he does that in every movie. Like when they're first trying to convince the chemist to make the sedative for him. And and he's like, well, what are you planning on doing? Two dreams down. And he leans in and does that kind of cocky three. And he gives him like that little head nod that he does. I'm like, oh, yeah. Leo does the cocky head nod in every movie. <laughs> Here it is. Like, <laughs> And I think in this movie, I noticed it more because he didn't have as much. I don't want to say he didn't have as much to do, but he didn't have like a really meaty part to sink his teeth into. And I... I really do think it's the difference between Scorsese and Nolan because I think Shutter Island, that performance blew this one out of the water. And it's not like Scorsese had less story to tell in that movie. And he still managed to get a much more raw, much more emotional performance out of DiCaprio than Nolan gets here. See, I I think that what you're describing is actually the character arc. Like Like at the start of the film. He is still in enough control of his subconscious version of Mal that he trusts her to sit in a chair while he ties a rope and climbs down this building. And by the end of the film, she is such a wild card that he is losing his grip on sanity Mm. as well. Yeah. I I think that that opening scene when they're invading Ken Watanabe's mind is so important to setting the tone to his and Maul's relationship because there you see that he's used to her kind of bumping into to him yeah. in these dreamscapes. And so it makes sense that he's like kind of thrown off by how it devolves throughout the rest of this movie. 
Yeah, I mean, I totally agree, Brad, that the character arc is one thing that I would criticize as opposed to what we got in Shutter Island. I just also think that because there's not as much for him to really work with here, I don't know if I would ever call it peak Leo just because he's not doing peak Leo things for me. Oh, uh, I yeah, I, I I think I agree with you. I just that final scene with him and Maul yeah. is just so heart wrenching. And I, I think every time he is interacting with her is when he's at his best because oh, you yeah. can feel that restraint. You can feel him trying to not show Ellen Page too much, which what what was up with her name? Ariadne? Yeah, it's a Greek. Like, it's a Greek thing. Uh, I, yeah. Okay. It's, okay, it's Christopher Chris. Nolan being like, look, I can insert, you know, uh, mythology into my movie. Right. I Okay, Chris. Right. All right. All right. But like, I, I think that you can see that restraint of like not wanting to dive too deeply into this trauma with someone else. And I, I really like that side of Leo. But that does take me to another point. Why was Ellen Page in this? Sorry, not Ellen Page. Why was Ariadne, Ariadne, however you say her name, in this movie? Because she literally just walks around the set and listens to people yeah. and goes, huh, that's well, so, interesting. So here's the thing. First of all, I will say, I think Ellen Page does a really good job in the movie. Like, I think I, she, I, she does very, very good work with what she's given. And yes, it's very, I totally agree. And it's very obvious that her character is the audience conduit. She's new to this world. She's there to ask questions and get questions answered. She is there to get exposition out of everybody else. But but I think one thing that you're pointing out that I also noticed, Brad, is that she walks around and does like incredibly invasive things in the lives of these other people and never gets in trouble for them because, again, she can't get in trouble because she's the audience and the audience needs to know this plot information. Like, at one point, she sees Cobb just sleeping and decides, you know what, I'm just going to enter his dream with him. And, and why goes, not? Yeah, and goes and looks at all of his memories that are, like, incredibly important to who he is as a person. And I'm like, you, you just met her, like, four days ago. I think that's the, that's the hardest part for me. Is when you get things like that in a movie, it's it's the romance effect, right? It's when you watch a movie and the couple falls in love in like two days and a weekend and they're getting married and they they live happily ever after. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's like not how the real world works. <laughs> and that's how I feel about yeah. about Ellen Page's character in this movie. I'm just like, man, like I get it. You were trying to hire a new, bright, young architect to keep all of your deepest darkest secrets right like no bro you're just hiring her to make some mazes for you well so moving outside of the character arcs themselves though brad this cast is fantastic like just the assembly of of the people in this movie that they got is maybe nolan's best cast i would i would venture to say top to bottom best cast i don't think all of them are really on their A game in this movie. And I'm interested to hear what you think about it, Brad, but let's just name off a few of the people that you see in this movie. I mean, you've, aside from DiCaprio and Ellen Page, you've got playing his, uh, DiCaprio's wife. You have Academy Award winner, Marion Cotillard. You've got Academy Award nominee, Ken Watanabe. You've got Killian Murphy playing Fisher. You've got Pete Postlethwaite playing Fisher's dad. You've got, uh, Oh, who else? Joseph Gordon-Levitt. You've got Tom, Tom Berenger. Tom Berenger. You've got pre-A-list Tom Hardy. Like the list just goes on and on. It is stacked. Brad, we're already running long on the first half of our episode. But before we go to break, like call somebody out for being good. Call somebody out for being bad. I struggled with Joseph Gordon-Levitt in this movie. Me too, I, dude. <laughs> he was just so. And the funny thing is. Tom Hardy's character calls him out, too, for being bland and boring. And when he does it in the movie, I'm like, oh, that's funny because he is bland and boring and I don't like him yeah. in this movie. The thing for me like, is is that he doesn't even come across as bland and boring. He comes across as a guy who's trying to act cool or trying to act tough. Like, right. like Joseph Gordon-Levitt, the actor seems like he's trying to put on like I'm in a cool guy movie. I'm I mean cuz let's be honest, this is the closest thing that Nolan ever made to a Bond film. And right. and he is trying to play this like too cool for school person and maybe it's an intentional decision, but it always seems like he's 2 seconds away from like breaking out into laughter. Like yeah. it seems like he is he's not even buying his performance halfway through this movie. 
Right. Yeah. I, I really struggled with him. Uh, he, yeah, you, you pretty much just said everything that needs to be said about him. He, he just doesn't, I don't know if it seems like he doesn't care or he cares way too much. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just, like doesn't, he's it trying, just doesn't work. He's miscast. Yes. He feels miscast. I, I don't know who else I would have put in there. Like, I don't know. Paul Giamatti's a great like sidekick kind of guy. Maybe you throw him in there. I mean, if you're going like young, young people in, in 2010, I don't know. Give me like, give me like early era Eddie Redmayne or somebody like put. Just just put somebody else in that role for me in it. I think the movie works Dude, better. I'm not going to lie. I don't like Eddie Redmayne that much. I I just think he's such a boring actor. Well, there it is. I mean, he would be perfect for this part then. <laughs> he probably would have. Yeah, yeah, I take it back. Throw him in there. <laughs> All right. So, Brad, I'm going to say for my person that I think was really good, I would call out Tom Hardy because I think that his charisma really shines through. And this movie really helped launch him into being Bane and then everything else. But I really want to call out Marion Cotillard because I feel like Bro. she she might steal this whole movie, Brad. She's terrifying yes. when she's portrayed as a villain. She's heart wrenching when she's portrayed as a sympathetic figure. She is. I mean, she holds her own against Leo in those really emotional scenes. And I don't feel like those scenes work without having two actors of that caliber in those scenes. If you could give a score higher than an A plus, she would get it in this in this movie like. I really feel like she might have one of the best performances in just like in a singular role that I've ever seen on any movie for this podcast. I think wow. she, I wow, think her, Brad. I genuinely think she just knocks it out of the park in this movie. And she is the reason you care about this film. Like she is the emotional beating heart of this movie. Mm. She drives. But the, the beautiful thing about it is that she drives the emotion, she drives the mystery, she like she drives everything that is important about grabbing the audience's attention in this movie. And you see that partially because Ellen Page is curious about her throughout the whole movie cuz she is the audience. But like I her performance was just over the top in this movie. And let's not forget, just you know, for good measure, a fantastic Michael Caine cameo. Michael oh. Caine showing up in in every Nolan movie, playing Michael Caine in every movie. I was going to say, I and he plays I really, Michael Caine great in this movie. He does play Michael Caine just phenomenally in this film. I will <laughs> say, I appreciate. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing because I don't know enough about Hollywood. I it feels like Christopher Nolan is a very loyal director, mm -hmm. like to his people. Like mm -hmm. he's got Tom Hardy in this, he's got Tom Hardy in Batman. He, he's got Michael Caine in everything. Like it feels like he stays loyal to his actors, and I, and I really appreciate that about him. Absolutely. All right, Brad, listen, we have to take a break and drink this whiskey. So what do you say we hop a, a transcontinental flight over to Japan and try this Hadazaki? So our whiskey for today is Hadazaki Small Batch. Now, Brad, this is only the second Japanese whiskey that we have done on this podcast outside of uh, season two. We tried Nika Golden Gold, which was pretty good. And Dude, you know, that samurai like the sam top, though, the samurai was dope. bottle was amazing. The whiskey was OK. We are the least experienced when it comes to Japanese whiskey, partially because of all of the varieties of whiskey, you know, in in. Of the major producers, Ohio is just not getting that much of it. And, you know, there's now there's whiskeys popping up from Australia and India and the Philippines and everything else. We're getting less of that. But in terms of major market players, Japan is really shooting up the list. And I don't know much about Japanese whiskey. I'm not going to lie, Brad. I know that basically the the biggest players in the world of Japanese whiskey are two huge distilleries. You've got Suntory and you've got Nika. And then you have a bunch of smaller players underneath them. In doing a little bit of research today, I found out that Japanese whiskey differs slightly from scotch in terms of their um, willingness to kind of share 
recipes with each other that a lot of these distilleries are making multiple different mash bills and different experimental runs uh, for other distilleries to source. And so some of these smaller distilleries are basically sourcing sourcing their product from the larger distilleries. It's a really interesting kind of collaborative process they have going on there. In terms of what kind of whiskey it it tastes like, it's very similar to scotch. I mean, the Japanese masters uh, really followed the pattern of scotch whiskey. It, they try to make it from malted barley when possible. So that's, I mean, that's the wheelhouse you're working in when you're drinking Japanese whiskey. This one that we have today, the Hadazaki, was launched in 2018 by the Kaikyo Distillery. They put out two kinds of Hadazaki. The first one is called Hadazaki Finest, which is a blended whiskey, meaning that it has both malt whiskey and grain whiskey in it. The one we're drinking today is the Hadazaki Small Batch. This clocks in at 92 proof. It is 100% malt whiskey. It blends together five to six year old whiskey that's aged in a variety of different casks. Some of it's aged in ex-bourbon casks, some of it's aged in sherry casks, some of it's aged in Japanese Mizunara oak casks. So Brad, I am excited to get into this. I have a feeling it's going to be right up our alley because we both tend to like blended, non-peated scotches. So what are you picking up on the nose of this Hadozaki small batch? Man, you just said so many words. I, bro, I'm sorry. Eh. <laughs> We've only done two <laughs> Japanese whiskeys, dude. I feel like I had to give some background. And in the midst of that, I have been nosing the You drank a whole bottle. Yeah. All right, so so let's get these nosing notes then. They better be impeccable. Bob, this, I don't remember the Nika like super duper well, but I feel like Japanese whiskey is delicate. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a great word, Brad. Like, I feel like there's a complexity to it. You have a little bit of nuttiness, and yet it, it has some some cream to it that's mm. impressive. It's a little bit fruity. You get some of that malt grain smell to it. I, I feel like there's a lot going on, but all of it is kind of light and lilting and, and it, it draws you in. It's it's not like a heavy Beethoven piece. It's like a nice light aria. You know what I mean? What I love about this is that it's not heavily oaked. It, you know, it is five to six year old, but I'm not getting a dominant oak note on this. Now, the oak is definitely present, but this is a much more floral whiskey than I expected. It's it's definitely very bright. Lots of citrus on the nose, maybe some grapefruit, and then like just a, a really lovely bouquet of flowers. I just, I you're right in calling it delicate, Brad. And again, it's also, they don't add any color to it like you would get with some scotches. So in the glass, it's a very light color. It's a very light fragrance. It's just an overall really bright whiskey. I like this a lot, Brad. I don't know if it bodes well for the taste I, because now my mind is tricked into thinking that it's not going to have much of a taste because the nose is so light and delicate, but just going on nose, I think I'm going to give it an eight out of 10. Yeah. And like even the color, it's almost like if you like added some water in with honey, this light golden touch to it, it's a lot more clear than most whiskeys I'm used to drinking. So I, I would agree with you, Bob. It, it does make you a little bit worried about the flavor. I think on the nose, I'm gonna get I'm gonna stick with you, Bob. I think it's an eight out of ten. Well, Brad, I just took my first sip of this, and I will say that I don't think that it has a very complex taste. It's very alcohol forward at the tip of your tongue. It, it packs a little bit of a punch with the heat. On the mid palate, it just reminds me of a nice blended scotch. It's kind of like that, you know, entry level Johnny Walker red or black label. When you go to swallow, I get quite a bit of char and smoke, which I really like. It's not quite a peat as much as it's like ash, like like charred barrel. And so um, it has it has a much smokier finish than some of those blended scotches that we tried back in season two. And I like that a lot. I just don't know. And I don't mean to tip into like balance or finish or anything else like that. I just don't know how well it all ties together. It just kind of seems like it has a few things that happen as it crosses your palate, but not one kind of cohesive experience for me. I don't know, Bob. I For me, these these flavors are all working really well together. There's a little bit of citrusy zest to it. There's a lot of floral stuff going on. And then you get into that deeper, darker ash that I wasn't expecting with the light color and the the softer nose. So for me, I, I feel like this, this whiskey is a little more complex than I expected. And there, there's a lot going on. I think I'm going to stick at an eight on the palate. Yeah, Brad, I think I'm only going to give it a six on the palate. I don't think it's a bad whiskey. It's it's really enjoyable. 
it just doesn't seem like one that has a, and this is going to sound so snooty, but like, it doesn't really have like a story to tell. Do you know what I mean? I just doesn't, I, I'm, I can't, I can't get a grasp on what this whiskey wants to be. It doesn't really seem like a great sipping whiskey to me. It's not unpalatable. It's just kind of middle of the road. So I'm sticking at a six and that brings us to the finish. I do like the finish. I think it's a mouth watering finish. It's pretty short on the palate, but you have a nice warming on the way down and you do have just a hint of peat and a lot of char and smoke on the finish. I I think I prefer the finish to the taste, to be honest, Brad. I'm going to give it a six and a half. I, I think that I, I don't always think a ton about the proof. Like once I know like, oh, this is 110 proof. It's a 80 proof. It's a mm-hmm. whatever. Like I, I'm kind of done thinking about it. But this one. I don't know. I just feel like 92 proof is the perfect place for this whiskey to be. Like it's just hot enough. It gives you just enough of a of a hug on the finish that you're you're reminded that you're drinking a nice, you know, spirit, but it's not going to like overpower your senses in any way. I, I I really like the finish on this. And you're right, Bob, the the char and that little bit of oakiness and that little bit the the, the smokiness is just Really, really nice on this. I think I'm going to give it a seven and a half. All right. That takes us to overall balance. Brad, I do think that from even two minutes ago to now, I like it a little bit more than I did. I think once your palate acclimates to it, this does not have very much sweetness to it at all. It's a very savory whiskey. Now, I do think it has some level of of honey to it, but overall, it really does fall into your classic non peaty kind of scotchy taste. Once I got used to it, those sherry notes really come out. It's not, I wouldn't call it saline heavy, but it's definitely savory. And it really leads nicely into that smoke on the back end. The thing that's throwing me off on this is the nose because it smelled so fruity and floral and bright and sweet. And the taste is not bright at, I wouldn't call it bright and sweet at all. I do think it's still a thinner, lighter whiskey, but it packs a lot more smokiness than I thought it would. And so for me... I don't know if I would call it incredibly well balanced. I'm going to stick a six and a half again. I'm actually right there with you, Bob. Six and a half on the balance. It it does kind of belie a little bit from the nose to the palate to the finish. But overall, you can tell it is a well-crafted whiskey. All right, Brad. And that brings us to the price. Now, the Harazaki Finest, that one I was talking about earlier, that's more of a blend that one's made for mixing, and you, that one will run you thirty nine ninety nine in the state of Ohio. This one, the Hadozaki Small Batch, is really made, as they say, for sipping, and it's a little bit pricier because of that. This whiskey in the state of Ohio will cost you fifty nine ninety nine. So we're looking at a sixty dollar price tag here, Brad. How do you feel about it? I honestly don't feel too terrible about that. You know, I I think that it's hard because we know that the Quinta Rubin is $49.99, and that's just one of the best values you're going to get in the world of scotch. But $60 for what I would consider to be a decently complex, savory, uh, interesting whiskey, I don't think that's out of the question. Um, I I, I will always and forever think that scotch is overpriced. Um, So $60 is a lot. But compared to the market, I would say that this is a well-priced whiskey. I, I think I'll give it a 7 out of 10 on value. Yeah, Brad, I'm, I'm kind of right there with you. Like, I wish it was $10 cheaper. But also, I, I do think that generally Japanese whiskeys tend to be a little bit more marked up even than scotch whiskey. So, like, would this be a good $50 blended scotch? Yeah, I think it would. So as, as a $60 blended or as a $60 uh, Japanese whiskey, I think it's kind of right in line with what I would expect. So I will give it a 7 out of 10 on the value. And that's bringing me out to a 34 out of 50. Brad, what's that bringing you to? I'm a few points higher. I'm at 37 out of 50. All right. So that's bringing us to a 71 out of 100 or a 35 and a half out of 50. I think that's right in line with where this should be. It's above average. It's good. It's worth trying. Brad, would you recommend spending $60 on a bottle of it? Hmm. If you know that you like a little bit more savory of a of a whiskey, then I would say, yep, go for it. Yeah. I mean, I, I would recommend trying it. I would not recommend buying it. So, I mean, that's my distinction here. Good whiskey. I'm not dropping $60 on it anytime soon. You know what I would drop $60 on? Another viewing of Inception in the theaters. 
<laughs> Cinemark a- AMC, are you paying attention? This man's yeah. willing to drop sixty dollars. <laughs> Brad, let's get back into talking about Inception. All right, so we are back into talking about Inception. Brad, we both love this movie. We both recognize that it has flaws. I'm in a weird spot because going into the movie, I was like, I think this is better than The Dark Knight, and I'm going to take my hot take into this podcast with me. Coming out of the movie, I said, this is in no way better than The Dark Knight, (laughs) but it's still probably my favorite Nolan movie. And. And so I think we we have come to the point, Brad, where we probably have to nitpick something just to prove that we're willing to to concede some points. So on this watch through, was there anything that stuck out to you that you felt like you needed to address in this podcast? Let's uh, let's nitpick a little bit here. I So you said earlier that we weren't going to point out plot holes, but uh, you said that about you, not about me. Oh, How nice. the heck? So like. The the first layer of the dream, they're falling off the bridge, right? And there's mm-hmm. no gravity. And you have these cool scenes with the moving hallway and Joseph Gordon-Levitt is fighting this guy in the most bland manner you could ever imagine. And in my brain, I'm like, what the heck is... Like, he literally just laid all these other folks down to sleep. Like, they're clearly going to be rolling around the room. And they talk about how, like... All you need is a kick to wake you up. And I'm like, look, look, Nolan, like you needed to show him like strapping them down to the bed with rope because clearly they would be rolling around in there and have woken up from their third layer of the dream. But let's just say that they stayed in the third layer of the dream. Why is there gravity in the snow land? Because the entire time they're in the snow land, there's no gravity in the second layer of the dream. They're just floating there. They show them floating there. Like Joseph Gordon-Levitt has to tie them all up head to toe. And there's no gravity. And, but, but there's gravity in the third layer somehow. Like, I, I know you said no plot holes. And I love this movie to death. But that was something that this time through, I was just like, come on, bro. Yeah. Like, and, like, and that's the thing. Like, I don't want to get... I don't want us to just like devolve into nitpicking this movie, but I had a ton of nitpicks this time around that were all kind of in that same vein, Brad. I guess I'll stick to my biggest one, which is how do they actually get to share a dream space with each other? Because if you look at the way that they all fall asleep, they basically hook themselves up by like an IV to a machine that pumps a sedative into them. And looking at the mechanics of that machine, all I see is a machine that pumps a sedative. So like there's they don't wear anything on their heads that would be like reading their brain waves. There's nothing to what I'm seeing on screen that would indicate that like when Ellen Page puts a sedative in her arm that she would jump into Leonardo DiCaprio's consciousness. Like how do they actually accomplish that? Is something they never talk about and they also don't really visually demonstrate it on screen. It's just kind of like, yep, we're all going to sleep now. And we're, I guess we're all just in agreement that we're going to hop into somebody's brain and, and share a dream with them, but they don't show how. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, like the sedative is actually like the brain fluid of the person they're dreaming with and it mingles with their blood and they jump it. I, yeah. It's, I mean, it's how hard be. would it have been to just have them like wear a little device on their heads? Like that would have uh, answered that whole thing. Well, but they wouldn't have shown it until like the fourth act when they're in limbo. They would be like, oh, crap. We got to let them know. Oh, man, that's funny. <laughs> no, I, I'm right there with you, Bob. I remember wondering that like probably my third or fourth viewing. I was like, how is it that they're actually like in a shared dream? Like you don't really because like you said, all, all they needed to do was show, like, one IV going into them and then, like, maybe one going out with, like, some blood. 
And then you, you could have easily been like, oh, yeah, sure. Like maybe they're intermingling it in the machine and then redistributing it. And and that's how they share dreams. Yeah, but yeah, you're know, right. Just... They don't explain it at all. But I, I will say this. The fact that it took me like three or four viewings of the movie to even come around to the question of like, how are they actually sharing dreams? Mm. It just shows how entertaining this movie is. Yeah. And I'm kind of like, I'm kind of in the boat that I was a couple weeks ago with Coco. And with Coco, it took me till like my 25th viewing to start finding holes that were tiny, tiny, tiny nitpicks. And now I'm like, okay, the world that they built isn't flawless, but it is like, for all intents and purposes, perfect because you don't ask the questions when you're watching the movie. It's not until yep. you watch it for 50 times through. And Inception's kind of like that, except it just takes fewer viewings to get there. Like, it only took me, like you said, Brad, you know, five viewings before yep. I was like, wait a minute, none of this makes sense. And this, this all falls apart pretty much immediately when you really think about it. Like, the whole, like, subconscious thing, they're, like, armed guards, and they're able to, like, shoot and stuff. And in one moment, Tom Hardy's like, I can imagine... A, a big grenade launcher and you just have to dream bigger, darling. And yet the next minute they're like, oh, you know, uh, Watanabe got shot. Why can't I just imagine some surgical tools? And why can't I just imagine a doctor that's like fixing his chest? Right. Like if you could just dream up anything and fake anything into existence, why not that? Like, <laughs> like why can't Watanabe just dream up not having a bullet in his chest. Well, and again, like here's here's a really nitpicky one, Brad, just because we're we're doing it now. <laughs> when they're in the third dream layer down and Fisher dies and they ne- they know they have to go down into limbo to rescue him, they pull out a dream machine to to hook up into. Where the heck did they get that? Well, I mean, clearly they built it into each layer of the dream, but the problem is when they went into the dream, Ellen Page, the person who built the dream, didn't even know there was a layer beyond the third layer. So why would they ever (laughs) even need? Anyway, like these are the kind of things that you nitpick about when you've seen a movie 10 times and you love it. Like we wouldn't care to nitpick this movie if we didn't love it. And the whole point I was trying to make was like, we we still might enjoy nitpicking. Well, of course (laughs) I'm just saying like we wouldn't, if it, if it was a sucky movie, like we, we wouldn't waste so much time trying to like nitpick the rules of the, the world that it's built. Right. And the point I was trying to make with the Coco thing was like, Coco still holds up after 25 viewings. Inception holds up for like five, but it's still, I think Nolan is still to be commended for the fact that at least for me, it took me like five viewings before I was like, wait a minute. Cause it really <laughs> is just it, uh, like sleight of hand. Like he's trying to keep your attention over here so that you don't notice that the, the whole thing is a really flimsy construction <laughs> logically. And I think he does a really good job of distracting my attention. And I think that's probably why this is my favorite Nolan film, Brad. And maybe it's time for us to move into our final scores. If you want to get a final nitpick in, be my guest. But Brad, what are your final thoughts on Inception? Well, I honestly, Bob, what what you were just saying there, it it feels like playing peekaboo with a little kid. Like you can only do it so many times before object permanence sets in (laughs) and they're like, oh, wait, he didn't actually disappear. Right. He's still real. Uh, I'm uh, it's all good. (laughs) And it's it's the same thing with Nolan. Like you can only watch his movies so many times before you start to go. man, this just doesn't make a ton of sense. But daggone it, if he doesn't make some of the most entertaining movies I have ever seen in theaters. And I think there is something to be said for the idea that I don't know if movies are meant to be watched 20, 30, 40, 50, Mm -hmm. 60 times. You know what I mean? Like, like way back in the day, you might have seen Gone with the Wind, I don't know, 8, 10, 20 times in theaters. But once it was gone out of theaters, you literally could never see it again. Right. Like, that was it. And so with the introduction of you know television movies and VCRs and DVDs and Blu-rays and all these things, we're able to nitpick the heck out of them because you watch them so many times because you love them. And so for me, coming back to this movie for probably a double-digit number of times, I still am just blown away by the audacity in this movie. I do think more than ever, if not for Marion Cotillard, 
this movie would really struggle for me. I, I do think she ties together this film. But man, oh man, I just love this movie, Bob. It's so entertaining the 10th time, almost as much as it was the first time. So with all of that in mind, I, I've been kind of going back and forth between like an eight and a half or a nine. But you know what, Bob? I'm giving it a nine and a half. I love this movie. That's a that's so, so funny you said that, Brad, because again, when I went into the movie, I was like, I'm going to give it a 10. I don't care what happens. By the end of the movie, I was like, oh, this is like a nine at best. Right. And I, I kind of want to fall in the middle on like, I love this movie. I want to give it a nine and a half. I think I'll balance this out a little bit, Brad. I think I will try to be a little more objective. <laughs> I'll give it a nine out of 10. And I will say this it is a lower score than I gave to The Dark Knight. But I still think I would prefer to watch this movie 40 more times than The Dark Knight. Like, I just, yeah. it, it might be his most rewatchable movie. Yeah, and, and it's unfortunate. Really, The Dark Knight is like perfect, 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 perfect. Why is he using blue echo vision? <laughs> right. And then, it's, and then it's perfect. That's pretty much The Dark Knight. I think I care about the main character in this movie more. I do. Like, I, I care about Leo more than I cared about Batman. Yep. Yeah, you know. screw you, Christian Bale. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our final score on Inception is a 9.25 out of 10. But we want to know what you think. Do you think that we somehow scored this movie too low and that it should be a 10 plus? If so, you can reach out to us on social media. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, at Film Whiskey. Or you can give us a phone call. Let your voice be heard on the Film and Whiskey podcast. Our phone number is 216 800 Five nine two three. Once again, that number is 216-800-5923. Or you can leave us a voicemail on our website, which is www.anchor.fm slash film whiskey. Next week, we're going to lighten things up a little bit. We're watching the 1964 Walt Disney classic, Mary Poppins. So we'll see you for that next week for the Film and Whiskey podcast. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And I have one last thing to say to you, Bob. What's that? <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Film and Whiskey is produced, engineered, and edited by Bob Book and Brad G. And it's made possible from support from listeners like you. If you'd like to support the show, you can donate directly to us at our Anchor page, anchor.fm slash filmwhiskey, where you can support the show for as little as $1 a month. Or if you'd like some perks, donate to our Patreon page. You can find us on patreon.com slash filmwhiskey, where for as little as $3 a month, you'll receive benefits like membership to an exclusive Discord chat room, extended cuts of each episode, and early access to every film and whiskey episode. We want to say thank you again to our Patreon supporters, especially those sponsoring us at our highest viscosity level, and that includes our friends Corey Easterday, James Talbert, Austin Dupree, and Aperture Flash. We'll see you next week.